I've recently watched Christopher Nolan's Tenet and had good fun doing so. There's a scene in which John Washington's character explains something about time travel to Robert Pattinson's character and he responds with, I understand, I've got a master's in physics. Well, me too, so I guess I should also be able to grasp the concepts. This video will contain no major spoilers. To be honest, I don't think I've understood the film well enough to provide major spoilers. I guess I have to go watch it again. Very clever, Mr. Nolan. Usually in cinema, when people are shown to be smart, they throw around a lot of buzzwords that the viewer is intended to not understand. Loki stabilized the tunnel effect in the Avengers, and if I remember correctly, Tony Stark did a spectral decomp during a key moment in Endgame. It did quite feel like that in Tenet, though. The things said did at least have something to do with the concept they were talking about. I also kinda like that they went for a master's degree in physics. To make people look smart, screenwriters almost always let people tell you about their PhDs. I don't think I've ever encountered a character in a film that was said to have a master's, except for Howard in Big Bang Theory, where it makes him the punchline. Let's talk some physics. We are told that some objects in the film have inverted entropy and hence their time runs backwards. Many people may have heard the word entropy before and usually it is equal with disorder. This is a bit too oversimplified, so I'll attempt some clarification using an oversimplified model of reality. Imagine you have a system of many tiny magnets. For simplicity, these magnets are fixed in place and the magnetic orientation can point in only two directions, up or down. In my pictures I will feature only four of them, but in practical cases the number is usually of the order of 10 to the 23. This number is so horrendously high that it is practically impossible for us to know the magnetic orientation of every single one. It is, however, possible to measure the total magnetization of the system, which is just the sum of the individual magnetic orientations. This total magnetization is a so-called macroscopic quantity, because it is a property of the total system that is measurable without knowing the exact configuration. Temperature and pressure are also examples for macroscopic quantities, but we'll ignore them for now. The entropy of a system directly corresponds to the number of microscopic configurations that can produce a fixed macroscopic quantity. If we measured, for example, that the magnetization of our four-particle toy system is zero, we know that we have equally many magnets pointing down as we have pointing up. We do not know which ones point down, just their total number. There is a total number of six possible configurations that produce a total magnetization of zero. Up, up, down, down. Up, down, up, down. Up, down, down, up. Down, up, up, down. Down, up, down, up. And down, down, up, up. The total number follows from combinatorics. For n magnets, of which k point downwards, there are n over k possible realizations. That's the binomial coefficient, not a fraction. Now you can probably see why I picked 4 magnets as a very large number. If I had picked, say, 12, then there would be 924 possible configurations, resulting in a vanishing total magnetization. The number of microscopic realizations of given macroscopic parameters is usually denoted omega and the entropy S is defined as a constant times the logarithm of omega. S is a bit easier to handle than omega because it doesn't get quite as large quite as fast, but because the logarithm is a strictly monotonous function, the two entities behave the same for all practical purposes. And now for something apparently completely different. Tenet is not a film about thermodynamics, but about time. And other than thermodynamics, time is a concept that is really poorly understood by physicists. The theory of relativity tells us that time and space are interwoven and that they mix depending on one's velocity. There does not seem to be a special direction in space. At a crossroads you can choose to go either left or right. However, going back in time is, to our knowledge, impossible. So our everyday experiences, as well as numerous experiments, tell us that there is an arrow of time then one direction is the correct one, so to say. Almost all of physics suggests that this is not so. 
The Schrödinger equation, describing non-relativistic quantum mechanics for example, works equally well if you run it backwards by replacing t with minus t. In fact, if the Hamiltonian H is not time-dependent, which as far as we know it never is for a closed system, then the time-dependence of the Schrödinger equation can be discarded altogether. I'm saying almost all of physics, because there is one well-tested law that clearly involves an arrow of time. The second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of any closed system will only ever either increase or stay constant. An often used example to explain the concept of increasing entropy is the mixing of two liquids of different color. You can carefully prepare a glass with for example a red liquid at the bottom and a blue liquid on top. The macroscopic quantity here is the color distribution. Let's look at the microscopic realizations. To make the calculations much easier, I'll oversimplify again. Let's model the liquids such that the molecules are indistinguishable apart from their color and that every molecule has its cell in a two-dimensional space. I picked two dimensions because I can't draw three. The start configuration of red at the bottom and blue on top then has only one microscopic realization, namely that all red molecules occupy the lower cells and all blue molecules the upper cells. Per definition, the system therefore has an entropy of zero. If we now mix the liquids, the result becomes purple, the macroscopic quantity color has changed. Let's for the purpose of modeling partition our liquid into matter cells, each containing four cells, and say that it only appears purple if every such matter block contains two blue and two red molecules. There are six combinations to realize this condition, which are all shown in the picture. If you have watched the video up to this point, you of course already knew that, because it is the same combinatorics as with the orientations of four tiny magnets. If we have n cells, then we have n over four matter cells, and hence the number of microscopic realizations of the purple color in our simple model is given by 6 to the power of n over 4, which is certainly larger than 1, meaning that entropy has increased. If n takes the plausible number of 10 to the power of 23, then the entropy has in fact exploded. Well, mixing two liquids feels like an inherently entropic way to pass your time. If you have a glass of blue and red marbles, you could argue that it is in a high entropy state. It is these pictures that somewhat justify to associate entropy with disorder. You can lower the entropy of the system if you spend the time to divide the marbles into two glasses, sorted by color. The second law of thermodynamics states, however, that by the act of sorting the marbles, you have produced so much heat that the entropy of the closed system that you are part of increased, even though that of the marble glass decreased. And here's the crux in the reasoning of Tenet. It is absolutely possible to reverse the entropy of parts of a system. In fact, some scientists, among them Erwin Schrödinger, the one with the equation and the cat, in search of a definition for life came up with a subsystem that locally decreases its entropy by extracting energy from the environment. Tenet tries to shock you by telling you that there are objects with inverted entropy. Well, your entropy is inverted and you are absolutely right to marvel at that. The second law of thermodynamics was originally purely empirical, it was just something people noticed. It can somewhat be derived from more fundamental principles, but I'm not going to go into that. We are also told that if you run backwards in time, then fire that runs forwards in time feels cold, because the exchange of heat is reversed. To evaluate this statement, let's consider what happens if both systems agree on the arrow of time, because I think this is a nice and insightful calculation. Take two systems, denoted 1 and 2, and let each system be described by the abstract macroscopic quantity energy. Now we bring them into contact, which means that they can now exchange energy between them. However, the total energy E shall be conserved. We can then eliminate E2 by expressing it as E minus E1. The number of possible realizations of the first system depends on E1, and the analogous is true for the second system. Any realization of the first system combined with any realization of the second system is a realization of the combined system. So the total number of microscopic states for a given energy is given by the product of omega 1 and omega 2. 
The entropy of the total system is, by definition, proportional to the logarithm of omega. Due to the properties of the logarithm, this turns the product into a sum. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that with time, S should be maximized. This condition can be expressed using the derivative with respect to E1 and setting it to zero. The minus sign comes from taking the partial derivative of E2 with respect to E1. It is no coincidence that the definition for temperature in theoretical physics is given by the reciprocal of the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. It follows that the entropy of the total system is maximized once the two subsystems have exchanged the amount of energy needed to bring them both to the same temperature. In all practical cases, the entropy of a system increases with energy, which is equivalent to saying that it has a positive temperature. Negative temperatures are possible though, and have been realized in experiments. If one of the subsystems reverses the second law of thermodynamics, then we cannot make a sensible statement about the behavior of the total system, and this whole calculation breaks down. My guess is that any subsystem following the normal flow of time is happy to take any energy it gets as this increases its entropy, while any system that has an inverted entropy flow will donate its energy. This means that if you bring normal and reverse system into contact, the normal system will probably suck all the energy from the reversed one until the latter has reached a state of zero entropy. If you remember the definition of entropy, a value of zero means that there is exactly one microscopic realization of the system. If you invest some energy, this number usually increases very steeply, meaning that the derivative with respect to the energy takes on a very large value there, which in turn means that the temperature is very low, close to absolute zero. I have not yet mentioned anything particularly hot or cold like fire or liquid helium. I think that regardless of the temperature of the outside world, the person traveling backwards in time would eventually freeze to death in the normal time frame. This tells us nothing about the time scale on which this happens though, and before this happens we will reach the point at which the person changed its direction in time. This whole argument was given from the viewpoint of normal time flow. For the inverted person, the entire rest of the world runs in the wrong direction and decreases its entropy instead of increasing it. This means that the inverted person will heat up because it gains energy from the world and cannot dissipate its own energy. From the inverted viewpoint, coming into contact with normal fire would probably burn because fire is very good at giving off heat. The same situation, considered with the normal arrow of time, would show the already burned inverted person coming into contact with fire, which quickly cools him or her down to normal temperatures. So yes, fire can cool an inverted person, but not from the inverted point of view, but from the normal one. I think somewhere in Mr. Nolan's reasoning a minus sign got lost. Apart from thermodynamics, Tennant also alludes to the concept of antimatter. The mathematical laws of quantum dynamics are exactly the same for any particle moving forward in time as for a particle with opposite charge moving backwards in time. In the end this boils down to two minus signs cancelling each other out. This is why in those objects called Feynman diagrams, which you've probably seen before, an antimatter particle is represented by a line with an arrow in the opposite direction. The diagram shown on the screen can be interpreted as an electron and a positron meeting at some point and annihilating to give two photons, or as an electron spontaneously deciding to travel backwards in time from now on, emitting two photons in the process. From the laws of quantum dynamics as we know them, we cannot tell the difference. The connection of time inversion and antimatter is very briefly mentioned in the film. It is said that whilst going backwards in time, you should never touch your former self that is traveling forwards, else annihilation will happen. Well, if in the world of Tenet you are truly converted to antimatter when you inverse your entropy, I thoroughly agree that you should not touch your matter self, but frankly you should best not come into contact with any normal matter whatsoever. Air is built from protons and electrons, as are you, so if you are suddenly made of antimatter and come into contact with the rest of the world, your complete body is evaporated within moments. To get an idea of the orders of magnitude here, when mass is turned into energy this follows the most famous law of physics, E equals mc squared. If the antimatter person weighs 70 kg 
and is completely annihilated, then an equal amount of normal matter is annihilated, so m is 140 kilograms. C is the speed of light, which is roughly 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So our explosion releases a total energy of about 140 times 9 times 10 to the power of 16 joules, which is about 10 to the power of 19 joules or 10 exajoules. For comparison, the Saar bomb, which is the most energetic weapon ever tested by humankind, would have completely destroyed a city like Paris had it been dropped there, yet it produced only about 2 times 10 to the power of 17 joules of energy. The Human Air Pair Annihilation Time Travel Bomb is more energetic by a factor of 50. 10 exajoule are probably also the energy demand to turn one person into an anti-person, which is roughly the energy production of the United States in one year. I wonder why they even mentioned the antimatter thing in the film, since, minor spoiler here, it doesn't play any role in the plot. I've said before that we know only one law of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, that contains a specific direction of time. There are hints, however, that on some fundamental level there's more to be found. One not very physical hint is that we experience events in a specific order and cannot truly reverse it. But there's another thing. I've mentioned that in quantum dynamics, matter and antimatter is mathematically identical if you reverse electric charge in the direction of time. However, almost all the matter of the universe, as far as we know, is normal matter, hence the name. We currently believe that the universe began to exist roughly 40 billion years ago and in the beginning was pure energy from which pairs of particles and antiparticles sort of sprang into existence. This works for example via the process described in the Feynman diagram from before, after you reverse the area of time, which as we have learned is an absolutely fine thing to do in quantum mechanics. All processes we know, however, create an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Why then is there so little antimatter in the universe? Apparently some puzzle piece is missing, some law that favors matter over antimatter. If the interpretation of antimatter as particles moving backwards in time is valid, this would imply that this law also favors one direction of time. Some scientists currently think that this law might be an addendum to the weak force which is responsible for radioactive decay. A process which, by the way, might either be fundamentally non-time reversible or just follow the second law of thermodynamics. It is really hard to test this theory though, so experimental confirmation is lacking. This video got much longer than I originally anticipated. I want to make clear that although I think I debunked most of the ideas of Tenet, I made this video not with the intention of doing that and certainly not to spoil anyone's fun but purely because I like physics. I hope some of my excitement spilled over to you and I hope you are at least as entertained watching the film as I was. And that you have a laugh because the credits list the cast in order of appearance.